Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Tom Putnam, director of the John F. Kennedy Presidential Library and Museum. On behalf of Tom McNaught, executive director of the Kennedy Library Foundation, all of my library and foundation colleagues, and the Edward M. Kennedy Institute for the Senate, I thank you for joining us today. Let me begin by acknowledging the generous underwriters of the Kennedy Library Forums, including lead sponsor Bank of America, Boston Capital, the Lowell Institute, Raytheon, the Boston Foundation, and our media partners, the Boston Globe, WBUR, and NECN. Our purpose today is to hear from Senator Scott Brown about his life as told through his gripping new memoir, so I'm hesitant to say too much in his introduction. But before I share a couple of anecdotes, let me first recognize the Senator's wife, Gail Huff, a familiar face to all of us in Greater Boston who is here with us today. I also want to remind everyone that we'll be taking written questions from the audience, so there'll be staff uh, going through the room throughout the uh, forum. Put your questions on an index card and we'll bring them up uh, to our moderator. And second, uh, I want to remind everyone that the book is on sale in our bookstore and there'll be a signing uh, immediately following today's forum. My first story ends with one of the senator's recent punchlines. As you recall, in the main debate during the senatorial campaign, moderator David Gergen asked then State Senator Brown what it felt like to be running for the Kennedy seat in the United States Senate, to which Scott Brown famously replied, it was not the Kennedy seat he was running for, but the people's seat. In his remarks during the most... <laughs> in his remarks during the most recent St. Patrick's Day breakfast, Senator Brown mentioned that he would be appearing here at the Kennedy Library as part of his book tour, or, as he stated, as I like to call it, the People's Library. <laughs> no matter what you call us, Senator, we're honored and happy to have you here. I know that no one has come here today to hear any revelations about my past, but I hope you'll be here with me for a moment. As an Irish kid living in Massachusetts, I was your typical Kennedy Democrat until my family moved to Maine when I was 10, and I came under the tutelage of a wonderful high school teacher who happened to be a moderate Republican. Combine that with the fact that the town we moved to was Kennebunk, and I ended up as the youngest delegate to the 1980 Maine GOP caucus for George H.W. Bush. A couple of years ago, we had a conference here on the presidency and the nuclear age, and President Bush agreed to provide a video, video welcome. His staff, remembering the hours I had logged in as a volunteer at Walker's Point when Ronald Reagan chose George Bush as his vice presidential nominee, included in the president's opening remarks for our conference how delighted he was that the interest in politics and history that he saw in me as a teenager had led me to a leadership role in the presidential library system. Now, while this job is not supposed to be a partisan one, I'm slightly political, so I had not emphasized this part of my background when I applied for the job here. <laughs> so at the conference immediately following President Bush's remarks, I took the stage and introduced myself as Tom Putnam, the director of the John F. Kennedy Library, and then looking at Caroline, who was seated next to my boss, stated, at least I think I'm still director of the John F. Kennedy Library. During my first months at work here, I asked if former President Bush had ever spoken here. He had not, and he accepted Caroline's invitation, like other Republicans before and since, including President Gerald Ford, Sandra Day O'Connor, John McCain, Condoleezza Rice, and David Souter. And I'm proud that at this institution we're as gracious and interested in the observations of David Brooks as those of Mark Shields and the wit of Barney Frank as the quips of Al Simpson, the policy prescriptions of Madeleine Albright as the recommendations of James Baker, and in the poetry of Ted Sorensen as the rhetoric of Peggy Noonan. And again, we are honored today to add to that distinguished list our state's newest United States Senator, Scott Brown. This library is dedicated not only to the memory of our 35th president, but to all those who, through the art of politics, seek to build a better world. And while we may not always agree on policy positions, surely we can agree that Scott Brown's distinguished career in public service is fueled by the desire to build a better world, as informed by his conscience and life experience, which we are here today to learn more about. Our moderator this afternoon is Allison King, the Emmy Award-winning political reporter for NECN, where she has worked for the last 16 years, covering three presidential elections and countless congressional ones. Yeah. 
Following 9-11 and the Oklahoma City bombings, this library, like all federal institutions, was forced to take security precautions, including, for us, cordoning off the drop-off circle in front of our building. But of course, we're able to make exceptions, and I would always know when Senator Kennedy was here when I saw his blue Suburban parked out front. And now we want his successor to know that the People's Library will always reserve a special place for him and his truck. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Allison King and Senator Scott Brown. Thanks so much, Tom. Um, I always enjoy covering these forums, so it's great to be able to sit here and ask all the questions. Um, first of all, as a political reporter, um, I have to thank you, Senator Brown, for all that you've done in the past year and a half to really spice up the political <laughs> scene here in Massachusetts and give me a lot of grist for the mill and all we political reporters. Um, and I want to go on the record to say that uh, while I was one of the naysayers when you were running for the U.S. Senate. Yeah, I remember. Weren't, <laughs> weren't we all, though? I do want to point out that I was the only political reporter to choose to be at your headquarters on election night. Do you remember that? I okay. do. <laughs> so did you ever think you would be at the Kennedy Library as a United States senator talking about your life story? <laughs> You're right. <laughs> <laughs> I actually uh, was up, upstairs, actually, in the president's room and uh, looking over at the amazing view. And I said to myself, oh, my gosh, I, I can't believe I'm here. Uh, to actually have the opportunity to come to this historic building uh, and, and be part of something like this is beyond my wildest dreams. Uh, and before I start, I would like to thank, obviously, uh, everybody here at the Kennedy Library for the opportunity and also, uh, you know, for the way that they've warmly welcomed me. It's uh, felt a little uncomfortable. I still feel uncomfortable talking about a lot of the things, but uh, they said it would be uh, nice and the fact that you're here uh, obviously, you've always been very uh, professional and, and, I, I res and fair, and I truly respect that. So I uh, just want to say thank you to the library staff and, and uh, uh, the team uh, for making my wife and, and me feel so uh, warmly welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I want to jump right into the book because that is, after all, why we're all here. And I have to say, I'm sure there's a mixed bag of people in here who've read it, who are halfway through it, or who are going to read it. These are all the Republicans in Massachusetts, right here. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. It's right here in this room. <laughs> well, you know, I have to say, I found the book pretty hard to read at times, uh, particularly uh, the chapters about your childhood. And a lot of it has been made about the sexual abuse, which was terrible, and we're going to talk about that in a couple minutes. But um, I actually found the stories of neglect and abandonment to be even, you know, sort of tougher to read. And for those of you who do don't know, I'll give you a couple of the facts. You know, both parents divorced three times. Basically, a completely absentee father. He let you down over and over again as a kid. Three stepfathers who were horrific, not to mention abusive, um, left you to fend for yourself at a young age, never enough food. How hard was it? to write this book, did you have to sort of dig down into the deep, repressed recesses of your brain to pull all this out, or was it very much on the top of your mind? Well, I think when you're in that situation, my family is no different than many other families. My mom and dad were married four times, not, not three. Uh, my mom's happily divorced, and my, my dad's happily married. <laughs> uh, however, a lot of the experiences that I had in, in my life, uh, you know, you try to put them away in a box, and... Uh, but they're always there. You just have to kind of open the box and they come flooding through. And was it difficult to talk about? Absolutely. But I can tell you, since writing it and having the opportunity to talk uh, it through with the family, the, uh, my mom, my, my dad, actually, about four or five weeks ago, we were having breakfast. And, and he looked me right in the eye and he said, you know, I just want to say I'm sorry. I, I didn't really know what was going on because back then, you know, we were a, a family in turmoil. We were... Um, you know, struggling to kind of just get our act together. And uh, it was the first time in about 50, 51 years old that he actually, like, looked me right in the eye. I could tell he was, he was deadly serious, and it meant a lot. And my mom, uh, the same thing. It was very difficult. Obviously, I put it all out there, but when you do those sorts of things, sometimes it, it, it opens the door for further conversation. And you, in fact, then talk about, yeah, was that the time you kept calling to come home? 
you know, when that's when you're at summer camp? I said, yeah, Mama, that was, that was this summer. And she said, oh, my gosh, I wish I knew. And, yeah, now when I'm 52, it's great to, you know, reflect back and try to change it. But back then, you know, she was having troubles. That's why I was at camp. And uh, so it's been a good process. We're, we're, we're really uh, getting balanced, and it's nice. I, I want to read a, a little passage uh, that Thank I just you. thought was really sad. You know, most nights... He writes, I would take my basketball to bed with me. I would lie in the dark, sometimes crying, sometimes thinking, but most of the time just talking to my basketball, and I would fall asleep with it in the crook of my arm. It was nothing more than a nylon carcass and a butyl rubber bladder pumped full of air, but it seemed to be nodding or occasionally whispering back to me. A sage sphere listening in the darkness, absorbing my secrets and my despair. I locked myself away under my covers thinking, what's the point? Is this it? and pleading to the silence. There has got to be more. You were a young kid. Was there, any, was there any joy in your life back then? I mean, do you look back and feel like I had a really unhappy childhood? No, no. I, I, listen, I had challenges, certainly, but there were, there were difficult times and obviously some uh, more maybe difficult times than other kids my age. But I also had really some great coaches, some good mentors that I was able to bet. That scene lasted probably until I was 17 years old. I mean, I would do that often until finally you, you, know, you could see the, the light at the end of the tunnel that through hard work and having those good mentors uh, with me. Uh, and, and obviously, as, as you'll read uh, or talk about Judge, Judge Zoll uh, and others who took an interest. So, yeah, of course I had fun, but I was, I was angry. I was angry all the time, and, and I was looking for ways to kind of lash out. And, but not for basketball, for me. And for other kids, it's art, it's music, it's, it's soccer, it's baseball. But for me, it was basketball. And you, so. Yeah, well, one of the things that I also couldn't imagine as I was reading this was how your parents must have felt reading this. And you touched on this a little bit, but this is not a flattering portrait of either of them. I mean, your mother seemed completely checked out in, to some degree and even resentful um, you know, of having to deal with you to the point where at one time she dropped you off with a sort of a strange sister and you didn't know why, how long you were going to be there or why you were, you know, when she was ever coming back. What was that first conversation like with your mother after she read the book? Well, um, it was obviously difficult for both of us to talk about, but it enabled us to actually talk through that particular uh, situation when I, when I went to stay with my, uh, one of my relatives. And uh, it gave us an opportunity to, to, to say, like, why? tell you? You know, in, in, in reflecting, she was uh, a little confused as to why, too, because we were a family in transition then. We had many challenges, and I, I think I know that she did it because she loved me, and she wanted me to be safe and cared for, and uh, you know, the fact that and when you say my, my mom was neglectful, it wasn't by choice. I mean, it, you have to understand, and back in the early 60s and 70s, you know, you, you, it's a different time. Uh, she was always working three, two, three, sometimes four jobs, uh, you know, made, made, made bad mistakes with her marriages, not because of anything aside from the fact that she was always trying to provide for us. And so I, I think personally, and it's in my book, that I got my work ethic from my mom, uh, the fact that she would never, ever quit. She's still a fighter to this day. And, uh, and for that, I'm exceedingly grateful. The one quality that she has given both my sister and me is, is that, that grit and determination to never, ever, ever quit until it's over. So while um, she was out there, you say checked out, I say she was, she was challenged with just an amazing amount of burdens. Two kids, you know, trying to put a roof over her head, you know, battling every day with a whole different, you know, type of lifestyle. A single mom in the 60s and 70s. Um, you know, she, she, throughout it all, she loved us. Did she ever say, gee, Scott, I wish you hadn't told X, Y, or Z story? You know, she, she understands that I'm, I'm an independent guy and, and I'm going to kind of go to my own, you know, beat anyway. Um, if you read the whole book, though, you'll find that it's a hopeful book. It's not just, in the first part, it's difficult to read. And, but it actually goes full circle and shows how we've all come together and grown as a family. Uh, and, and believe it or not, this election in particular and, the, and a, a couple of pr elections prior to that have, have brought our families together collectively, together. You know, my wife's family and my family, my, my, my stepbrother and stepsisters, you know, everyone's kind of together and they're like working and they, they don't care 
Oh, you know, oh, here's, here's Bruce. Oh, here's, here's Judy. Oh, you know, none of that was evident in this time. It was all like laser focus. So the good point of the entire experience, not only winning, but is actually brought my family together in kind of a strange way. Well, we, you know, we talked about your mother and your father. There was, you know, obviously some pretty significant issues there, too. Constantly, you know, sort of breaking promises to you. He remarried several times and had other kids. Um, and then at one point, and I thought this was, you know, and again, sort of sad, he moves to Newburyport and has another family, another couple of kids. Um, a, a rarely, occasionally, you were invited to spend the night. It was always on a couch. Um, and while your siblings had these nice bedrooms and were going on vacations with them and whatnot. Um, and, you know, you basically talk about the fact that you felt that there was not one photo in this house of you and that you kind of felt airbrushed out of his life. I mean, it's the same thing with your dad. Has it been, you know, I can't sort of imagine you have a connection with him anymore. Well, the, the, well you're wrong, because uh, up until I was 20, Three years old, there was a very, uh, very loose association. We kind of passing ships, and then when I won the Cosmo picture, the whole Cosmo thing, as many of you remember, um, and continuously remind me of actually when I'm <laughs> running for re-election, uh, especially, um, it was a point when I actually felt a little bit more confident, believe it or not, as a man. I was, you know, doing interviews and I was, you know kind of just growing up, I was maturing, and I remember saying, and it's in the book, we, I was, went to my stepbrother's baseball game, and he came, and he says, you know, I read what you said, the, the fact that I wasn't there. I said, well, Dad, no offense, it's true, and you get a choice. Either you're in my life or you're out. And, you know, I'm so thankful that he made the decision to say, I'd like to be in your life. And ever since I was 23 years old, we've been building on this relationship, which to this day is, is rock solid, as, as actually, you know, culminated to the, the fact that we went out again as we go out regularly and he, he looked me right in the eye and said, I'm sorry. I mean, what else can you, can you do? He, listen, they make, my parents have made bad choices. They are the first ones to admit it. Uh, but throughout in the entire uh, part of our lives, you know, there was, there was love there. Tough love sometimes, different kind of love, but they always, I think, had our, our best interests at heart when they were kind of wrestling with their own challenges. And my family, like I said, is no different. I think anybody here can relate to having dysfunctional families. And we're a work in progress and will continue to be a work in progress. But the good news is, is you know, before the book, we were here. Now after the book, we're like right up here. And we're so much closer. We, we've been talking about so many different things. I actually got in the mail uh, a packet filled with pictures and letters and, and explanations of my dad's father and my grandfather and my great-grandfather. I had no idea. You'll read in the book. I, if you gave me a million dollars, I'd say, I don't know who they are. I wouldn't even know them if you showed me a picture. Now I actually was, I'm telling my kids about my dad's side of the family. And it's really, it's really invigorating and, and, uh, for me as an as a older man now. Well, let's shift gears. Let's talk about your life of crime. Uh, you were, you know, you were quite the serial criminal at ages about 11, 12, 13. Uh, you described stealing food, stealing clothes, and other things, you know, that a teen might want. Why did you do this? Did you do this because other kids were doing it? You were desperate. Um, you know, did you have like a conscience about all this? Well, I, I did, wasn't doing it with other kids. No one really knew I was doing it. Uh, it's not something you, you know I was proud of. It was. Uh, with the food, it was because I was hungry, and very rarely, you know, we didn't have a whole heck of a lot of food. Even though mom was working, there was rent, there were car insurance, car payments, you know, babysitters, a whole host of things. And I was at the point, I was 5'10", 11 years old, you know, eating everything in sight. Anyone who has kids knows that, you know, you buy the gallons of milk, it's like, well, 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 it's gone in a minute. And uh, I was playing sports, and uh, it just, I just did it. And did I think about it? Yeah, a lot of times I, I knew it was wrong, you know, and I, uh, but it was uh, bad decision making, and I certainly regret it. But um, well, then you know, one day, of course, uh, at the Liberty Tree Mall, you got caught stealing albums, and you were sent to the. I need to explain what albums are to oh, people. That's right. Oh my God. I think that's <laughs> <laughs> well, yes. Big I, CDs. Yes. Yeah, that's Made right. of vinyl. Big CDs. And these were of the Led Zeppelin, Rolling Stone variety. Yes, I'm Led Zeppelin, kind of Black Sabbath. Yeah, I was well, a hard rocker. <laughs> so you were caught stealing some albums, and you ended up in Judge Samuel Zoll's courtroom. And you, you referenced him a minute ago. But um, 
I just want to read a little passage here, too, as well. You say, uh, he looked down at me with his massive frame in that big leather chair and threw me a lifeline. He wound his way back to basketball and asked me if my sister and my half-brother and sister came to see me play. Yeah, I answered, a lot of times. They try to. Did they look up to you, he asked? Yeah, they look up to me. I'm the guy who tries to keep everybody together. And he said, wow, that's great. How do you think they'll like seeing you play basketball at the local house of correction? Because that's where you're going. You're on your way to jail right now, as evidenced by the way you went in and stole those records. You really didn't care about the businesses that had to work hard to pay their employees. And the fact that you took something that wasn't yours, it was as simple as that. I know now how I seem to Judge Zoll on that morning, lost poised to go horribly wrong, but with potential. And in, the, in those moments, he decided that I was worthy of help. My sentence, as he handed it down, was to write a 1,500-word essay on how I disappointed my brothers and sisters and how I think they would like to see me play basketball in jail. How, how pivotal, pivotal a life moment was this? Well, I wouldn't be here. Uh, you know, that's for sure. You think you would, you could have uh, gone no, to jail no, in yeah, another while well, you were a minor? On, I was on the road. I mean, I was I was stealing records and uh, you know just making bad decisions. You'll also see I was driving my mom's car at like 13. You know, I mean, I was doing everything that you read about today. And if I got caught today, I would absolutely have gone to jail today. But it was a different time. And thank God, I often do thank God uh, that He was there and. Uh, he, uh, you know, gave me that choice, and I took advantage of it. Does this shape the way you feel about when you deal with legislation having to do with crime and young kids? Yeah, when it comes to issues of crime and punishment, I always come down on the side of, uh, of the victims, uh, and I also try to have very uh, strong beliefs in law enforcement. And you'll also read in the book when I had an opportunity by mistake, I was getting some uh, stuff at Staples. And I had a, you know, two huge carts filled with stuff and um, marched out to the car and I noticed I didn't pay for a stapler. And this is, you know, a year and a half ago. And I, the first thing that came to my mind is, Judge Zoll's watching you. <laughs> and so I brought it right back. And uh, he's actually battling cancer right now. Yeah, when was the first time after, you know, you were a kid, okay, when was the next time you ever saw or talked to Judge Zoll? Oh, probably when I was, uh, when I was elected a state representative, uh, Judge Winslow was a judge, and Judge Zoll was the head, uh, the head judge, and um, Dan mentioned to the judge, hey, do you know Scott Brown? Remember Scott Brown? He was a kid in your court, and he says, yeah, I, I do. He's a tall so you had told the story. But I told it to Dan only oh. because of... Uh, his position, his position and, and the fact that we went to Tufts and Boston College Law School together. And uh, he mentioned it to Judge. So when I was a state senator, I called him once or twice and I said, hey, you remember me, Judge? He says, yeah, yeah, I do, of course. I'm so very proud of you. And uh, as we went on, and, and uh, he knew that I was writing a book and I've known that he's battling cancer. He's really like battling cancer. And uh, I went over to his house about a month ago and we sat down for good hour and a half, and I said, Judge, why me? You know, why me? And he looked me in the eye, and he said, you know what? You came in, and you were lost. I could, but I could tell when I asked you, you know, so, uh, Scott, are you a good student? And I said, well, Judge, you know, I'm a very good student in some areas, and I need a lot of work in other areas. And he was like, wow, okay. So he's, uh, versus coming in looking, you know, slovenly and, and acting a certain way and disrespectful, I looked him right in the eye. I told him, yes, I'm good in some areas. I'm, I need work in other areas. And that's the first time he said that anyone had ever done something like that. And then he was talking about sports. He says, you know, I know you like music. You know, obviously, he started because <laughs> cause he had kids. He had five kids, and he, said, he knew all the rights. So he started talking about music. I said, wow, this guy's pretty cool. And then, he, you know, so he made me at ease, and we're just having a regular conversation and then he starts talking about sports. He says, well, you like baseball, this. And I said, well, I really like basketball. He says, you're any good. And he had known of, of, of me a little bit because his kids play sports. And I said, yeah, I, I'm really good at basketball. He says, well, how many points do you average? I said, I don't know, 25 or 30. He says, wow, that's great. That's great. And then he said, you know, how do you, how do you think you'd like to see, see your brothers and sisters would like to see play basketball in jail? And, and it was like literally somebody hitting me over the head with a two-by-four without actually hitting me. And, uh, and I, I wrote this essay, and, and he also reflected back. He said, you know, you were the only kid that called and spoke to the probation officer and said, 
because he did that a few other times. Does it need to be double spaced pen or pencil? <laughs> yeah, seriously. Is it, can it be on composition paper? Can it be in a notebook? It, I was, and I called like three or four times to make sure that I did it right. And then we sat down and, and talked about it, um, you know, for a good hour. I mean, now, I mean, this would never happen today. You can't go in. A, imagine a young boy going in a judge's chambers alone today. Never happened. So it's just really fate. The fact that I was in the right place at the right time. Had I been in maybe Middlesex or Suffolk, where they kind of have a lot more activity versus Essex, I wouldn't be here. I know it. All right. So you know, you knew when you wrote this book that the sexual abuse would be the headline. Did you not? I wasn't sure what the headline would be. When 60 Minutes uh, came in, they, they talked about a whole range of things. They talked about the stealing. They talked about my family. And then I remember being in a committee hearing in, in my office saying, oh, you got to come down right now. They're doing the teasing. And I saw the tease, and I, I, I guess I'm, I was a little naive. I thought they would do a, a wide range of things. But they didn't. <laughs> but they didn't, okay. right. So it happened to you at summer camp. I think you're about 10 years old by a camp counselor. You thought he was a pretty good guy. Um, and you have said that nothing was consummated. But, you know, he made you touch him, and he said he'd kill you if you told anybody. Um, you know, did you sort of agonize over whether or not to include this in the book? Yeah, of course. <laughs> you know, I've been, as I said, you, you put things in your brain, and you kind of put them away, and you say, okay, next. I mean, while I was dealing with it, I wasn't certainly going to let it hold me back in, in the things I was going to try to accomplish in my life. Um, yeah, I, I spoke at length uh, about it with, uh, with the, the, the woman that was helping me write the book. Now, did you think of consulting Gail when you did? No. I, I, you I, think I, she'd put the kibosh right on yeah, it? Yeah, she, I told her, actually, I gave her many opportunities to read it. Honey, you want to read it? Yes. You sure? No. Yes, no. <laughs> yes, no. Yes, no. Yes. Finally, it was about uh, uh, the last run of the galleys. I said, honey, this is your chance. You have a chance right now to read it. Do you want to do it? And she said, yes. And I gave it to her. And then she was like, you know, the first thing she did is she, she was crying when she read it in various sections. And she gave me a big hug. And then we talked it through. And she said, you sure you want to do this? And, and uh, I said, well, you know, it's tough to talk about. I tell you what, but I finally have a, an opening. Because whenever you have people come to you as a legislator and say, you know what, uh, whether it's, uh, you know, this person or that person, if I all of a sudden say, oh, yeah, that happened to me, too, then it's not about them. It's about me. And that was, there was never an opportunity to actually go and say, yeah, me, too. So th with a lot of the legislative things I worked on during my uh, time at the State House, you know, I would focus on you know, victims' issues and, and try to make things a little bit more palatable. Um, but, yeah, of course I wrestle with it. I still wrestle with it. Yeah, I was going to say, are you still sort of traumatized by it? I, I wouldn't say traumatized because you... You, you put things away and, and you, you, they're there and you open it up. I'm, I'm thinking a lot more about it than I ever have in my life. And for many people, um, it takes, they can do it right away. And, and gosh, I wish back then I would have had an opportunity. I was 10 years old. I was at a camp for a reason because there's no place else to go. And I was, I was a hellion. I was, I was lost. My family was lost. So I was there for a reason. And, and, and when I called my mom, say, Mom, I want to come home. And she mentioned this to me when she heard some of the interviews. She said, was that the summer that you were having those problems with that guy? I said, yeah, Mom, that was the summer. She said, oh, my God. And, you know, she started, she was very emotional. She said, I'm so sorry. I said, it's, Mom, I understand. You were having troubles, too. It was just a different time in our lives. And I, I had one of the more powerful stories. And when I'm signing the books, I will say it's been really amazingly uh, uplifting for me as a man. I have people that have come up to me and, and for the first time in their lives they actually either write a letter or they tell me personally it happened to me it happened to my friend my mother my brother my sister I had somebody who, who called uh, whose dad called him up and says you know what do you think about Scott Brown I can't believe he took 42 years to talk about something like that that's, that, that's amazing son uh, do you believe him that's crazy and fortunately the son said yeah I do dad it takes time different people do it in different ways he said, well, good, let me tell you what happened to me 45 years ago. And he told his son for the first time. So stories like that, I, I hear them every day. I have, I have a bunch of letters I was reading this morning. And my thought was, and still is, if I can help one person do what I didn't do, which was tell somebody. Because uh, I fought back, and, but I didn't tell anybody because I didn't know who to tell. I didn't trust anybody. I, I wasn't going to tell my mom or dad because they were dealing with their own things. My grandparents were just too old. 
and you really didn't have the, the, the ability, I think, to deal with it. And everyone there in the camp was, I mean, that's, that was a perfect victim. You know, anyone who's been through it, you understand it's all about control. And they get that control thing not only through threats, through manipulation, through the constant overbearing, just, you know, I'm watching you, I'm watching you, don't tell this person because I'll find out. So you just kind of suck it up. So it sounds like you really don't have any regrets about doing no. any of this. Yeah. No, not at all. Um, now, you know you've been criticized for not providing more information about the, who this guy is, if he's alive and well and out there still committing, you know, assaults. You know, is that a concern of you, yours? Well, uh, once again, for everybody who has had this happen to them, they deal with these things in their own time. If it was, you know, five or six or ten years, yeah, I, I would do something about it. But 42, three years later, um, you know, I'm still dealing with it. I'm still kind of wrestling with it in my own way. And for people who are kind of leveling that criticism, it, it tells me that they've never had that experience. They don't know what it feels like. And, you know, if they want another story. I mean, there's enough stories written about me already, to be honest with you. Uh, is it another story they want? Well, I'm, I'm going to continue to deal with it in my own way with my, my wife and kids and, and my family and, and with the hope that if I can continue to help other people, you know, battle and, and respond and deal with it, then I'm, I'm good. I don't care about the criticism. Um, well, it wasn't just the sexual abuse. It was, there was the physical abuse as well growing up. Um, so we have to talk about the stepfathers in your life. There is a happy ending, by the way, folks, okay? <laughs> just want to say, yeah, okay? Yeah, but you guys so know all that. We're only stuff. talking about you eight pages in the book. You make no, it seem like it's no, like 9,000 no, no, pages. No, no. It was a lot of this, the whole beginning. I was like, I read it on an airplane, and I was like, you know, I felt like I was stuck to the chair. I couldn't move after. So Dan, Al, and Larry. Let's start with Dan, your mother's second husband. He was a truck driver. He had no interest in you. It, he, he drank too much. Um, and there was a, a couple of stories about his, you know, beating you up. One in particular, a big fight between the two of you. Uh, he started, you know, you started biting him. He well, started this is swinging at you. Him and my mom. Yeah. Well, and you intervened. Well, tried to. <laughs> yes, tried to is the key, I guess. Um, you know, you know that poem, Children Learn What They Live? <laughs> why didn't that, you know, why didn't, did, did you start to go down that road? I mean, we no, talked a no, little I've bit about No, I've never been physically violent at all. I, I, I actually recognize you know, the mistakes of my, my pa parents, and I think as a result of that, I've tried to, I remember growing up saying, I'm not doing that, I'm not doing that, I'm definitely not doing that. I'm going to do that, but I'm going to do that better. And I like that, so I'm going to do that. And I remember, you know, almost like checking it off, but, you know, as I go, went through my life. But, uh, yeah, I mean, that was a situation when my mom was getting the crap kicked out of her. You know, it was late at night. Thank God we lived in a duplex, and I heard it. I went, went running out, and, you know, I was the only guy. I was it. It was me. So I, I went right at him. I bit him on the inside of the leg, and I held on. I just kept biting and hitting. It was like... At, at six years old, by the way. So, you know, the, you remember those things. And, and like I said, fate. Thank goodness that we had people living upstairs that called the cops. You know, there was uh, another horrible stepfather, Larry. Um, you had your own issues with him, and there was more physical abuse. Now, he's come out and said 90% of that was fabricated. Does that make you nuts? No. No, I wouldn't expect, anything, I wouldn't expect anything different. My mom, my sister, and I, you know, lived through that uh, together. And uh, I know my mom and sister felt compelled enough to come out and say, not only could he have written, is everything in, in the book accurate, he could have written a lot more, and, and which is true. Have you and seen or heard from him in years? No, no. I don't Nor know. do you want to, I imagine. No, I, I, don't, uh, I don't have any, any scores to settle. This is just a part of my life. It's not the only part of my life, but it was a, a time in my life that I was, you know, continuing to, to grow and went through these situations that really I didn't have a heck of a lot of control over. Well, perhaps a better topic that you'd prefer to dwell on is basketball. Um, needless to say, your love for, your talent uh, for basketball seemed to be a saving grace for you throughout your life, um, an escape, a sanctuary, an identity. Um, so you talk a lot about it in the book. You know, what was it about basketball? Because you seem, you know, pretty fanatical yeah. about it. Well, um, my dad played. I think I remember, you'll see in the book, there's a picture of me surrounded by my, by my dad's basketball trophies. And I think anybody who has a father or a mother, whether man or woman, you want, always want to be better. And I think, it, you know, in, in reflecting back, I think I wanted to be better than my dad. And the fact that I actually had three coaches that, that actually, uh, you know, took a real interest in me and said, wow, you could really do something with your life. 
And my first, you'll read in the book, the first coach was Brad Simpson. He's a eighth grade, uh, was an eighth grade teacher, and his his uh, wife was the teacher when I snuck into the summer school. And summer school back then is for kids who didn't do well academically. I wasn't at that point. And I remember my yard was out back, and, and all the kids were playing in the summer. I said, "Wow, this is great!" So I kind of melded in. I snuck in. And then they're like, who's this kid? But no one really cared because they kept going in and out for recess, and I just kind of walk around like I belonged. And then she came up to me. She says, who are you? I said, oh, I'm, I live over there. She says, what are you doing here? I said, I don't know. It looks fun. She, and to this day, she, I'm the only kid that she ever had that actually wanted to go to summer school. <laughs> but her, once again, fate, her husband was the basketball coach for the eighth grade team. And he came and saw me, and by then I was, I was 11, 10, 11, 12 years old, and I was almost six feet tall. And he's like, whoa, I want him. And the, he gave me my first basketball that I kept dribbling, the one I took to bed. And uh, um, so I had good mentors uh, that helped develop that, that desire to play. As a matter of fact, I just played the other night with Arnie Duncan, uh, Secretary of Education, and Reggie Love, the president's right-hand man, and couldn't walk the next day. <laughs> So when are you going to get that basketball game I, with the I president? was speaking to Reggie and Arnie about it directly. I don't think the president's going to play me because I was the high scorer the other night. And, <laughs> and, and, and Reggie was there. He says, whoa, okay, how about you and Arnie against the president and me? I said, that's great. <laughs> We're waiting for that to happen. So you go to Tufts University, full scholarship. No, they um, didn't have scholarships at, at division. I had full financial aid full and financial some academic aid. Okay. scholarships. All right. Um, and you were, I thought it was sort of interesting, you were active in a lot of things in college besides basketball, um, student government. Who knew Scott Brown sang in the jazz choir? <laughs> no, do you yeah, still yeah. sing? Uh, no comment. <laughs> um, so, and you, and you joined the National Guard, um, which was, you know, where did that come from? Or is that something that you did because you needed the money or, you know? Well, back at Tufts, uh, I did, I was in the Tufts Jazz and Show Choir. I was in the, uh, uh, I was a hero and funny thing happened on the way to the forum. I was in a fraternity. I was uh, active in student government. I was an athlete. I, I wanted to be a well-rounded person. It was the first time in my life when I actually had an, an amazing opportunity to kind of be better. And I was, and I, I had, the uh, reason I went to Tufts, as you read the book, is because I needed to be within striking distance to help my mom and sister. I mean, I could have gone to a whole host of other schools, uh, but Tufts was, I could run home if I wanted to. I would usually borrow bikes or cars or, or motorcycles to get home uh, in a moment's notice. Um, but the guard came in, uh, Blizzard of 78. Uh, I saw what the guard did, and I knew a lot of the uh, people, one of the, one of the, uh, Commanders was a football player. My mom and he went to high school together. I remember going to the Wakefield Melrose football game and seeing him in his uniform. I said, you know what? The National Guard did an amazing job. He said, that's great. You want to come down and see the guys? And next thing, <laughs> next thing I know, I'm like, signed, sealed, and delivered. So it was really kind of a spontaneous yeah, decision. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. And, and your coaches weren't too thrilled yeah, about that. Yeah, my coach was like, what, are you kidding me? Because usually, you, as you know, if you have kids in AAU and all that, you play summer basketball, and that's all I did. I played three or four t times a day. But I actually would. Do, I went to Fort Dix, and I remember actually keeping my stuff hidden underneath the bag where my dirty clothes were. So when other people would go drinking and kind of hanging, I would actually go and I'd sneak on the other side of the post and go play hoop uh, with the regular Army guys. You know, I also, speaking of basketball, and... I actually thought when you got out of Tufts and you played your last game, you must have been sort of depressed. Yeah. Well, you didn't really address that, but your, your basketball career was kind of over then. Well, they, they, we had, uh, I went to Boston College. They have the college leagues and the summer leagues. But I, listen, I knew I wasn't going to be a pro. You know, I, I Would was, you have loved to have gone that route? I, I, I still have the dream. <laughs> I was playing the other night, and I could have sworn I saw uh, uh, Doc Rivers in the stands watching me. <laughs> But uh, I think anybody who's anybody, I, I, honestly, my wife will joke, she's going to laugh right now. I, I have this dream that I'm in the, in the garden. You know, I buy a ticket, I'm having a beer with the guys, and, and they say, you know what? We're, and they, they, one person gets hurt, then the other person gets hurt, then they, <laughs> and then they say, you know, we need another player. We need a sixth man. And, and uh, 
you know, we, we're going to do a raffle, and they call out my number. I'm like, oh, my God, this is great. <laughs> I go down, and I suit up and, you know, play like five minutes, and I'm like the happiest guy in the world. It's like that movie Eddie with Whoopi Goldberg. You know, she gets to be the coach. Well, I'm like, guy, yeah, I get to play. Did you love that your daughter Ayla played at BC? Yeah, I, I, both my daughters are hard, hard workers. And, uh, you know, during that whole experience after Tuss, I mean, I went to Dave Cowens, Havlicek, Nelson Sanders, Pete Maravich, Calvin Murphy's camps. I mean, I got to play with, uh, you know, Rudy T. And, and David Thompson and all those legends. I mean, I played with them, so it was, it was just as good. But playing with, uh, watching Ayla play uh, was like a carbon copy of everything I learned from all those great coaches and all those camps, you know, I gave to her. And I remember, uh, Gail and I were talking about it the other night. She says, you know, do you miss seeing Ayla play? And, you know, uh, how, do you, how do you deal with it? And I said, you know what? Uh, there's only one thing I really remember. I remember going, like many of you probably, to the. I come home exhausted, and Ayla's like, "Dad, let's go to the gym. We'll go shoot around." We would l- literally do what I did in the book. We'd go around, we'd open doors, we'd check windows, we climb through windows to go into the gym, and uh, <laughs> we'd shoot around. And I say, "Okay, now you need to do the mic and drill." And anyone who plays basketball, it's left hand, right hand, left hand, right hand. Okay, now you need to do it in reverse. Basket's behind you, left hand, right hand, left hand, right hand. And she'd always be yelling at me and throwing the ball at me and screaming, why am I doing this? Why am I doing this? You know, every night she'd come home, right, honey? And she'd be crying, Dad, making me do all these crazy drills. <laughs> and then I remember playing, uh, her playing uh, North Carolina, and a uh, 6'9 woman was covering her. And she's six foot, you know, soaking wet. She's driving down the, down the lane, and, and this woman's coming, and she's going to stuff her. And Ayla takes one extra dribble and goes up and under and does the reverse layup, and she... <laughs> And she looks up at me and she goes, <laughs> <laughs> ding, 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 it all paid yeah. off. Did you ever encourage Ayla or Ariana to go into the military? Uh, actually, Ayla has always had a strong um, patriotic uh, uh, sense. She just went to Afghanistan about a month ago and performed for the troops in, in the Tajikistan for two weeks. And when she came home, she says, Dad, I'm thinking of joining the Marines. <laughs> like, excuse me? <laughs> So why don't you take a week off and we'll, f- <laughs> and we'll figure out. They're both very patriotic. They're very, they love this country. They love our, our men and women who are serving. And uh, I think had the at West Point or one of the other schools recruited Ayla earlier, she would have gone to one of those. Hmm. Um, also, just I want to touch on, you know, BC Law. Did you decide to go to law school? I mean, was someone encouraging you or, or supporting you to do that? Or did you just... No, I, 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 I always had a strong... Uh, even when I was doing the whole Cosmo thing, the only reason I did it is because I had no money to pay for law school. I wanted to be a lawyer, period. And I felt... And when, when, even in what, yeah, freshman I think a lot of it had to do with what my mom and, and we had gone through. The experience I had with Judge Zoll it really left a, a lasting impression because I knew that there were a lot of good people out there that could really make a difference and actually solve problems. And, and I wanted to be a, a family lawyer. Uh, and then that just is so crazy. Anyone who knows ended up by the time it's over, being a, a good real estate attorney and enjoying representing you know, banks and people. And when you buy or sell a house, it's usually a happy experience. And, and I remember, once again, speaking to Gail, so that's it. That's my last divorce. We were literally fighting about pots and pans and fishing rods and tennis. I remember it like it was yesterday. I said, that's it. <laughs> Done. All right. Well, I want to go to, on to a topic that, you know, most people aren't really very interested in, but, be, you know, it was sort of a, a key port part of your life. Um, Cosmo magazine. Um, so your first year. You still year, have that picture on your screensaver? <laughs> you know, I was. I was a junior in college or a sophomore in college when that came out. So I'm sure I was, you know, checking it out along with every other college no, student whatever. back then. But in, in any event, um, <laughs> your first year in law school, your sister Leanne enters you in Cosmopolitan magazine's America's Sexiest Man contest, and it comes with this thousand-dollar prize, which sort of sounds like. Not a whole lot of money right now, right. but back then I'm sure it was more it was, like twenty thousand dollars. Basically, 000. it was, it would have paid for almost a full year, uh, full tu- well, um, half a year of tuition. There you have it, right there. Um, three previous winners: Burt Reynolds, James Brown, and Arnold Schwarzenegger. Just, <laughs> just, <laughs> okay, so we all knew what happened. You won. Um, is it true that when Helen Gurley Brown, the iconic editor in chief of Cosmo magazine, called you, you hung up on her? Yep. Yep, I said I thought it was a joke because I was literally right in the middle of finals, and I thought it was, you know, we, I, I have a sense of humor. I try to, at least my wife and others say it's kind of crazy sometimes. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I, I thought it was a joke, so I hung up. And obviously you got back uh, Yeah, they connected called back, and I said, good, send me a ticket in advance. I'll be there in a couple of days. And I got the ticket the next day. 
So you go to New York for the big Cosmo shoot. Um, the only problem is you claim to have a pizza, beer, and you claim to be in pizza, beer, and popcorn shape, yep. which something tells me is not my version of pizza, beer, and popcorn shape. But in any event, um, this is this is what you wrote. Uh, previously, the most formal of all the pictures I'd ever posed for involving me balancing a basketball on, was balancing a basketball on an index finger while I wore my basketball uniform. Here, I was completely nude, although my privates were hidden, in a room full of strangers, men and women. I was totally unprepared. I was embarrassed and very, very uncomfortable, discreetly trying to cover myself and feeling completely freaked out. It showed. <laughs> The photos were not what they had wanted. On top of that, I looked pale and I wasn't physically toned. I probably needed to lose 10 pounds. The Cosmo staff saw the photos and told me to come back in two weeks. They wanted me to be, as they put it, more cut. They'd be doing a reshoot at a house in the Hamptons. So you basically go on a starvation diet for the next two weeks and had a photo shoot do over, followed by the red carpet tour. I just, this like kind of blew me away. Here's this guy, we know what your upbringing was like, we know what you've been through, and all of a sudden, he's on the Phil Donahue <laughs> show, the Today Show, Barbara Walters. I mean, what was this like for you? Uh, it was uh, like being a United States Senator. <laughs> 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 it, was, uh, it, well, it, was, it was certainly going from being a law student. The, the only good part of it is that I had been a law student. I was always the guy that the torts professor picked on. You probably saw Paper Chase with you know, Professor Housley, or I think his name is, always picked on that one guy. I was the guy. So I was very, I was very comfortable kind of debating and talking at that point in my life. And we had a, 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 and I had a sense of humor, but it was nerve wracking. Uh, just like doing this is somewhat nerve wracking too. And I tried to, <laughs> I tried to handle a lot of things with a good sense of humor and, you know, kind of laugh about things and probably a little bit of a defense mechanism, but I, I, I did it to pay for school. And I mean, how bottom did that line. whole tour go? Was it, well, did you it did it, it was a 32-state tour, and we did all the shows, Evening PM magazines, all Donahue. I actually saw Phil Donahue at the Alfalfa dinner in, in D.C. with his wife and, and reminded him. He says, yeah, I know, I've been following you. <laughs> and uh, But it was basically a way to pay for law school, period. I, I had no other way. I didn't have, there was no other way that I would have paid for law school, and I treated it as a business the whole way through and enabled us, uh, my, me to buy, you know, a property, our first condo together and, and uh, parlay it into other types of, I've been saving since I was 17 years old. So, you know, in the months that followed, you kind of got swept up into that whole New York City lifestyle of the early 1980s, which obviously meant Studio 54. Uh, and you describe one, one night you were taken to the back room uh, of Studio 54 where I think it was the first time you were there with disco star Rick James holding court. And you wrote, on the tables around them were piles of cocaine and draped over their chairs were leggy women with plunging necklines. Someone must have told them who I was because they called out pointing to the drugs and the women, hey, Cosmo guy, want some of this? Want some of that? I shook my head, no, I'm good and I ordered an orange juice. <laughs> okay, first of all, is that true? Yeah, it's definitely <laughs> true. And secondly, why did you not, you know, partake in all this? Well, I, I was, uh, you know, I was an athlete, first of all, um, and it was uh, something I've really never really been into, so. Have you ever tried cocaine? No, I've never tried cocaine. Um, but back then, it was part of the culture and it's not Absolutely. part of the culture that I was part of because even though I was in New York, I was still going to law school part-time at Cardozo. I was still in the National Guard when they do drug tests all the time, and I was not about to jeopardize my military uh, training and, and, and hopefully my future in the military and, you know, my potential of being a lawyer because of, you know, just going out partying. It wasn't, wasn't worth it. So... Um you know, this, this sort of wild New York City life by a lot of people. Well, remember, I was, I was doing, doing National drugs. Guard. I yeah, was doing I National Guard. I was still in law school. And even though the, and I, was, I was modeling, you know, paying for law school, even though that was happening, uh, I still had a good base of friends around me, you know, who were always there. The kids from Wakefield, we would go to Studio 54. They'd say, oh, my gosh, I can't believe we're in Studio 54. And we would just go and, like, no different if we were down in Saugus, you know, at the, or the Kowloon or someplace. The same thing. Or Boston, Boston, or... You know, anywhere on, uh, on Lansdowne Street, same thing. 
so you know you were you were in law school you got the military thing going you got the modeling thing going any one of those things could have been you know all consuming um, but you got you. word uh, you'd been given a training deferment from the National Guard and you got word that you would either have to go to advanced training or get knocked out of the program um, and you know you seemed like you were sort of struggling with what to do next with your life or how to move forward and just at this time you got invited to a birthday party at Christy Brinkley's birthday party at Studio 54. And you write that the last thing you remember is talking to a New York socialite you met who had gotten you a beer. I'm going to read a little part of this. The next, the next honey, morning... Honey, block your ears. <laughs> Excuse me for that. The next morning I woke up in a bedroom and didn't know where I was. Slowly, it dawned on me that I was in the socialite's apartment. There were pictures of presidents on the wall, and her assistant was flitting around the rooms, but I had no memory of how I got there, no memory of anything. The whole night was erased, as if someone had slipped something into my drink, which is probably what happened. I dressed and left, walking down Madison Avenue, staring back at my reflection in the window glass, in the window glass saying, Who the hell am I? I looked at myself and did not like the person I was becoming. That morning, I called my military science professor and asked him if the opportunity to go to advanced camp was still open. He said yes. I went back to Boston and I completed all my tests, and two weeks later, I was standing on the parade grounds of Fort Bragg being yelled at by drill sergeants. It was the best decision I ever made. So you kind of, you, you actually made this conscious decision to say, I'm done with that lifestyle? Yeah. I mean, did... <laughs> You know, did, did so, you, the whole modeling thing, there was so much money involved. There was the, the, the lifestyle. Was it that you didn't, you weren't really enjoying it anymore? No, listen, I, 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 wa I wasn't who I was. It's not how I, the person, I, I always, very athletic, care about m what I put in my body, um, wanted to make sure that uh, I stayed a good person, and just wasn't who I am, and I figured I'd go and, and get back on track. Okay, so uh, finally, uh, on page 191, you meet your wife, Gail, which was fun for me to read because I've known Gail and she's a fellow, been a fellow reporter in Boston. And um, every book has to have its awe moment. So here, here it is. <laughs> Hold on a minute. Okay, you want I'm the tissues, there. honey? <laughs> That's why you brought him. He knew this was coming. Okay, not only was she gorgeous, she still is. She was and is funny and smart. She has a husky, deep laugh that is to me one of the most joyful sounds in the world. Sorry, Gail, I had to do this. Her mind is constantly working in different directions. She is fascinated by the people she meets, and she is uniquely giving and warm. As a 25-year-old guy, I was captivated by her face and her body, but a quarter of a century later, what I find most beautiful is her heart. She is the person I look for first whenever I enter a room. I did it then, and I do it now. Gail is the half that makes me whole. Everybody? <laughs> so, you know, I think this is one of the starkest things about this book, for me it was anyway, was that after this miserable childhood, um, to turn around and then have like sort of the model marriage and be the you know have wonderful children and you know what what was your what's it's your easy. secret to it? It's us? easy, you know when you do when you went through what I went through you check off I'm doing that I'm doing that I'm not doing that I'm not doing that and our marriage is no different than anyone else's marriage. Uh, young people that I see, uh, Gail and I were talking the other day about you know why am I taking an interest with some of the younger people in the office? I said because I feel like. You know, they're, they're here, their first job. Uh, they, they, uh, their parents have told me personally, hey, we keep an eye on my son or daughter. And uh, some of them are actually getting to the point where they're getting married or getting serious about marriage. And I remember I say to them, listen, a couple of things. Have a sense of humor and don't sweat the small stuff and be patient. And usually that's the, that combination of things uh, tends to work out. And we're no different than many other people we have our challenges. We're, we're, we always try to improve our relationship. And it, uh, let me tell you, there's been a lot of stress the last year for some reason. <laughs> you know, well, I, our, our I whole life is totally different now. And uh, we uh, uh, communicating and talking and talking and talking and talking and talking <laughs> huh? and talking, honey. 
It makes it all kind of work out somehow. Well, I love that you're such a softie about your family because he gets choked up whenever you ask him about his kids and his wife. But anyway, there's so some great questions. I was going to cry today, so, so far so good. <laughs> well, I'm just following in Barbara Wal Walters' footsteps here. Um, so, <laughs> so I'm going to go to some of the questions because yep, I know I love questions. Yeah, we're running questions. out of time. And yeah, and uh, sometimes usually the best questions come from you all. And this is sort of um, getting into your Senate career, which I was hoping we would yeah, be able to shift into. Fire away. What has been most surprising to you about serving as our U.S. Senator or the most challenging, most surprising, most challenging? Well, the, I would say without a doubt the fact that we're, we're doing, uh, I'll give you an example. I've had the honor of serving, first of all, so thank you. It's, it's been something I never would have thought of in my wildest dreams. Um, that being said, I've had the opportunity to go to Afghanistan, Pakistan, Israel, Dubai, and Jordan. And as I travel around the world and meet with the kings and queens and prime ministers and business leaders, all the way, all the way down to the poorest farmer, all they talk about is jobs. And since being back, we've talked about it more this session, but last session we only spent 12 or 13 days talking about anything to do with jobs. And here we are, we're in the toughest economic uh, recession that, that in my lifetime. And yet we're not doing the one thing that can help us, you know, get out of this mess and that's focus on jobs. That's been the most difficult thing to kind of get my hands around and surprising thing. Um, but this person is reminding me that, yes, there are a few Democrats here. No, I'm <laughs> shocked. And this is a great question because I was wondering this too. What motivated you be, to become involved with the Republican Party as opposed to the Democratic Party? And I have I've been asked that before, and I think a lot of it comes from the fact that my mom is on welfare. Um, we're always struggling with our dollars, and I've always felt that uh, the Republicans uh, tend to uh, use the dollars better, more you know, wiser. I know what the value of a dollar is, and it's just something I've always felt, I think, growing up. Um, I, I had a lot of respect for uh, President Reagan and uh, you know, some of the, the fiscal conservatives, because make no doubt about it, I'm a fiscal conservative. And uh, when it deals with our national security, I don't think there's anyone, maybe aside from Senator McCain, who believes that we need to keep our country safe and our families safe. Um, but on all the social issues, you know, I, I keep an open mind because there's good people on both sides of those issues. Um, but I just feel that I think a lot of it has to do with my upbringing and, and, and that I want to make sure that people's dollars that they give to the government are well spent. Um, you had said, I think as late as your 20s, that in the book, that you, you know, never really, politics wasn't on your radar screen. And I know Gail mentioned you're running for U.S. Senate for the, or was it for selectmen, I believe it was in Rentham. Was that when you first, you know, thought of even running for office? Well, it was because uh, I, when, I, when we first moved to Rentham, there was an open assessor position. Somebody had slashed the guy's car or tires or something. I said, oh, that sounds fun. <laughs> you know, I'm a real estate attorney and they're talking about real estate issues. I can go in, I'll be fair and we'll just do my job and everything would be good. It'd be, give us a good time to understand the town and learn about everybody. And uh, then I did that for a couple of years and took a couple of years off. But it was really about a school override issue that I got involved in way back when Ayla was in one of those, or Ariana was in one of those little carry things. But that was really the first time I had any interest because of issues affecting my community where I live. Um, good, another good question. Do you feel that the emergence of the Tea Party and the far right direction of the Republican Party is dangerous for the GOP? Well, I'm not sure if... if the Republican Party is going far right because I know there's a lot of uh, good people within our own party. Uh, you have a, a new breed of Republican. You have Senator Kirk, Toomey, Portman, uh, you know, Senator Ayotte up in New Hampshire. They, they all have different geographical areas. And I think there's a role for, for not only the Tea Party, but all sorts of groups to, to, to basically be part of the process. Um, because uh, politics and, 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 and parties and, and, and what we do should involve everybody. It's not just one particular interest group, because I represent everybody in Massachusetts, not just the Tea Party, not just the Republicans, not just the, the conservatives. I represent the Democrats. I represent the independents. You know, everybody from all interest groups. And, and while there's a role, uh, certainly, for not only the Tea Party, but people who are supporting the Tea Party, um, you know, I, I, I represent everybody. The other question is here, do you think the ultra-conservative wing of the GOP will find a candidate? Do you get the feeling that they're find, looking for a candidate to challenge you? Um, if, in, you know, in you mean in, in Massachusetts? Yes. There's an ultra-conservative wing in Massachusetts? 
Listen, I'm a Massachusetts Republican, and you know, I'm not I'm not focusing on on my job right now. 2011 is, is time to focus on solving problems. Come 2012, folks, we can beat the crap out of each other anytime we want. But right now, we have a perfect opportunity right now, right now, to solve problems. And I, I challenge the president, I challenge my own party, I challenge the majority party, and everybody in between to focus on doing the jobs right now. We can do more later. Um, another question. Since you have declared your intention to not run for president in 2012, is that firm? Yes. Would you announce who your <laughs> Is that the president of the Lions Club or <laughs> or what? <laughs> Would I already did that. <laughs> Would you be willing to announce who your chosen nominee would be? Well, I think it's too early. Uh, obviously, there's, there's, I don't know who's in. Uh, you know, if you want to ask me that question in a month or so, uh, I think everybody is just kind of posturing and you know poking and prodding to see doing exploratory committees, et cetera. Uh, I just know that uh, we need to get our economy moving. We have some very real fiscal and financial problems. So whoever it is, I hope they address those things right away. Um, I support your efforts in reaching across the table to work with the Democrats. What do you see as the major roadblocks to others doing the same? Well, don't forget it's a two-way street, folks. It's not just me reaching across the aisle because I've done it. You've all read about it. But, you know, check the voting records to see how many times that they've reached out across to me and us. And it's virtually non-existent. And uh, so I'm encouraging not only my party to do it, but it, it's like going to a dance. I mean, you can get up there and dance all you want by yourself. But if it's a dance for couples, uh, you need another partner. And so I encourage and challenge uh, members from both parties to do those things. Because you can't tell me. I'll give you an example. We're in the midst of a massive budget stalemate in the last session. Yet in the middle of that, Senator McCaskill and I pushed through with relative ease the Arlington Cemetery Bill because soldiers are being buried in graves that were inappropriately marked. Some were empty. You've all read about it. We did that in the middle of a log jam, bipartisan, bicameral, in record time. So you can't tell me that you can't get things done. And we did it. So when there's a, a cause, and to me, I think the, the number one cause, listen, it's debt, deficit, taxes, spending, national defense, our security of our kids and families. That's it. That's all we should be talking about right now. And if we miss this opportunity right now with this continuing resolutions, with the debt ceiling, with all of these very important issues, then we are going to have a very difficult time stepping back from the precipice because right now we're in a financial emergency right now. And we need certainty. Businesses need certainty. Individuals need certainty. You need to know what's next. You need to know what's next. And my role is to, number one, read the bills. Number two is to understand the bills. If I don't, I find a way to do it. Number three is to make sure that if it increases taxes or increases deficit, I'm not voting for it. And if it uh, is good for Massachusetts, good for the country and creates jobs, I'm all over it. Hitting those five parameters in every single bill that I do. And if you don't understand something I'm doing, folks, just pick up the phone and call. I'll get you the information, not the misinformation that's out there. It's so important to understand what your elected officials are working on right now. In my role, you may not agree with me 100% of the time, but each and every time you know exactly where I stand, exactly what I'm doing. When's the last time you felt good about that sort of thing? So that's my job. Like it or not, that's who I am. I've been that way my whole life. I tell you how it is and let the chips fall where they may. Politic. Um, politically, has President Obama been a disaster? Oh, yeah. I'm going to answer that question, right? <laughs> Are you kidding me? No, no, listen, the president has, first of all, the president's a good man. He's got a good heart. He's got a, two girls like I do, and I've encouraged them never, ever to say that they're available on national TV. <laughs> I did that, you know. <laughs> that being said, uh, I'm not going to go and criticize the president when I'm trying to find common ground to, to solve problems right now. Well, how is that beneficial to anybody in Massachusetts or in this country right now? There's plenty of time, as I said, in 2012 to kind of beat each other up. But right now, when I can work with them, I'm going to do it. When I'm going to work with the Democrats, I'm going to do it. And people say in Washington, oh, I can't believe you worked with the Democrats. I, said, I look at them and I say, we have five Republican senators in the Massachusetts Senate, four now. 
And I've always worked with Democrats. So to me, it's like, you know, I get out of bed, I put on my pants, I put on my tie, I walk, go to work in Beacon Hill, and I work with the Democrats. But in other parts of the country, they have no clue because they don't have that uh, relationship with Democrats and, if it's a Republican state, with on the other side of the aisle with the Democrats. So I'm uh, liberal, conservative. I see a good idea. Democrat, Republican, uh, and hits those five parameters, read the bill, understand it, and all those other things, I'm going to vote for it, period. Do you think you make um, lawmakers like a Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell? Do you think you're, you're making him crazy? No, absolutely not. He's from day one. Uh, first of all, let's, let's, put a, let's put something, uh, the kind of mystery aside. When you're talking, I don't know about the House, but in the Senate, everybody works together. We recognize that we have fiscal and financial problems. But we know what the number is, but do we do it this way or this way, or do we go kind of like this and solve it? So we're right now, we're right here. We recognize we have these problems. And Mitch, from day one, has said, listen, Scott, I don't care how you vote. You know, you got here and none of us helped you. You're your own man. You do exactly, listen, the only guy that, when I went down, and it's in the book, the only person that met with me was Senator McCain, and he only met with me because I was in the military. And after I left, he said, you know, you have no chance, but, uh, you know, here's a check. <laughs> You know, it kind of reminded me of my wife. <laughs> you know, you have no chance. Uh, but, hey, you know what? Uh, I'm going to give you a check and I'm going to endorse you. Um, so I, I, uh, I don't owe them anything. And he said, just let me know. So I, I don't want to get side, you know, blindsided by the press. That's it. That's all he's ever said. Just let me know. You know, speaking of, of your, you know, getting elected or not, it sounds like, you know, you mentioned Gail even said she wasn't, didn't think you were going to win this. Your consultants didn't really think you were going to win this. I remind them every day. <laughs> every time they try to renegotiate the contract. <laughs> I mean, was it, was it, uh, did you, in your heart of hearts, you really thought you I were going to pull this off? I spoke with, I, I was at the Ur Urban Improv last night speaking to uh, Pat Lyons, who a lot of you know was very uh, involved, obviously, in the social scene in Boston. And he, uh, he said, you know what, I can't believe it. I can't believe it you're here. Uh, he said, I remember you talking to me right before you ran. You looked me right in the eye and said, Pat, I'm going to win. I just feel this energy out there. People are hurting. They're tired of business as usual. They want a choice. They want somebody who's going to tell them how it is, and they're going to work and hit those five parameters and, and be concerned about the spending and the deficit and the taxes and a lot of the, you know, get rid of the partisan BS. And you looked me right in the eye and you said you were going to win. And I, and I tell my wife that and my fans and friends and family all the time. So, yeah, I, I, I thought I was going to win, and, uh, you know, but, I, you know, I'm a, I'm, that's who I am. I'm <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, uh, I'm going to go to another question here. Oh, you know, I do have another question, too, about the book. You know, I imagine there were many stories that you considered telling and decided not to. Yes, in the second book. <laughs> <laughs> give, it, give us a little glimmer of, of a story. You don't do into all the details. What was something you chose to leave out? Uh, listen, there's, there's, uh, there's so many parts of a person's life that you go through. I mean, there's so many anecdotes of wonderful times I've had with friends and family uh, that I could, I could have written a lot more, but I, I wanted to basically touch upon the things that I, were, I felt would, would make a difference and people would really be able to relate to. I, I like to keep some things personal. <laughs> I mean... Uh, I, uh, these are all my words. Uh, the way I had to do it every morning from 6 to 8 in the morning uh, and on weekends on my private time I would get together. Thank you. So that's what you do here, huh? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Just imagine if you were a Democrat what I'd be doing to you. Um, and I had, a, I had a collaborator, uh, Lyric Winnick, who did, also did Laura Bush's book. And we would sit down, and she would tape and write, and we'd talk. And, and so every single word in here is mine. And uh, she just helped put it in, in, a, in a good flow, because I, I am not, you know, I love to write, but I, I didn't have the time or, or the... Yeah, I was going to uh, say, you have so much spare time to sit down yeah. and write a book these days. But I'm so glad I, I worked with her. She was really wonderful to work with and very thoughtful in how she came across. And... And reading it, you know, even Gail and, and the kids, when they read it, say, wow, Dad, it's, it's just like you. I said, it is me. It, it's me. I mean, I, and those are my words. So. Well, you know, so many people have ghostwriters these days. Yeah. Anyway, um, so another question from the audience. What will you do to encourage job growth in small business? Specifically, which is more important, eliminating unnecessary bureaucratic regulations or allowing tax breaks for the wealthy to continue? Well, 
I don't, I, don't, I don't think you can look at either or, really. I, I think it's, I mean, everything's on the table right now. I mean, everything. And to create, you know, tax stability for businesses for the next two years in the middle of a two-year recession, I supported the president's plan. That was his plan. I supported it. And so did Senator Kerry. So we looked at those tax breaks and other incentives, unemployment benefits for folks. It was a total package. You can't just take a bill and say, oh, we're going to do this and this, and then we're not going to. No, that wasn't the bill. The bill was this. Um, we're doing a small business bill right now, and uh, it, it's going to be a good bill. But I know for sure that we can't uh, help small businesses and any other business uh, if we're going to raise taxes in the middle of a two-year recession, if we're going to overregulate bunch of things we can do. You saw the report that said we have billions of dollars uh, in duplication in, in just overlap. Executive order number one, fix it. Number two, we've got, look at, we have a, a, a fighter, the new joint uh, strike fighter, $104 billion over budget. Billion. And you were talking about cutting $61 billion from the budget. So how about actually fixing the things that are broken right now? Streamline, consolidate, top to bottom of every, every plan and, and, and program we have in the federal government. Trust me, folks, there's plenty of money there. $76 billion alone and just Medicare, Medicaid, not even abuse, just waste, just waste and, and duplication and doing it incorrectly. All that money that we're fighting about, there's so much on the other end hanging out there, the low-hanging fruit that we should fix like today. So if you look at small businesses, you need to give them an environment to compete because it's no longer Boston competing with New York. It's Massachusetts competing with the world, period. So we need to obviously make it a better business climate. Uh, you know, like many of your Republican colleagues, I'm wondering if you feel when it comes to intervention in Libya, do you feel like uh, President Obama went too far not consulting with Congress? going in on his own? Well, listen, the president's the president. You know, he has the, uh, he has the ability to make decisions uh, as the commander-in-chief. He's the guy that, that uh, has the mo monumental uh, and very serious task of putting our men and women in harm's way, and I can't even imagine what that feels like. And I know that he wrestled with it. And I agree with what he did in that. There comes a point in my life when I recognize that there's a dictator out there who's going to actually wipe out villages of win innocent women, children, families, just because he can. And at that point, you draw the line. Um, my concern, and I've spoken uh, about this in the, in the top secret briefings and other uh, meetings with uh, uh, Secretary Clinton and, and uh, you know, Gates and Petraeus and everybody else, is what's the mission now? W where are we going? How long are we going to be there? What's the cost going to be? Are we going to get reimbursed? Uh, you know, very, very basic questions to understand what the, what the final end game is. And we're still wrestling with it, but I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt that he feels, as I feel, that America is a, is a country for good and that we have an obligation as a country for good to protect those who ask for our help or may not have the ability to protect themselves. It's just who we are as Americans. So. Uh, last spring, I, I was able to come down and hang out with you for a couple that of days, fun. and um, it, was, it was interesting. <laughs> <laughs> and I, it was really kind of crazy because you'd only been around for a couple of months, and I mean, everywhere you went, someone wanted his autograph, someone was wanted his picture. He had, everyone wanted to know what he had to say on every topic. Things have changed down in Washington since then a little bit. Um, are things as crazy for you as ever? Yeah, yeah, they, they really are. It's, it's, it's a whole new level of intensity now because I am now I'm the seasoned senator, and they have a whole new uh, crop of young senators have come in. So if you've seen the movie kind of old school, remember that movie old school? Well, I'm kind of the godfather of the new senators, you know, in that role because they look to me in that I've been there, I've gone through, I, I've hired staff, I've actually. Uh, gone to uh, you know the meetings and, and, and gone through a lot of the trials and tribulations that they're just experiencing. So they they often come for advice and guidance, and it's really good. We have a staff that can do it and help them. Um, so we actually, it's very hectic. With I'm on armed services, homeland security, veterans, and now small business. And we have hearings, subcommittee meetings, uh, top secret briefings. You know we're always you know going on and on and on and leaving at five six in the morning, coming home at. 11, 12 at night, every day. 
every day. And we're home every weekend. Gail and I try to come home every single weekend to, to obviously, because this is where we live. And when I'm back, I'm visiting businesses. I went out to Acibet, uh Vocational Technical School yesterday. I uh, went out to visit a, a couple of businesses yesterday, and we try to just understand the challenges of people. Are you loving this life? Or is it, uh, are you enduring this life? Well, it's been challenging on our, our, our family, uh, just being together because we like to spend time together. Um, but listen, I've been giving, I've been giving, as one of the high elected officials of this country, one, uh, one of 100 senators to try to solve our country's problems. I don't think there's any place I'd rather be right now than representing everybody listening and, and here to try to solve our pro country's problems. Uh, I, I was given, you know, an opportunity to do something good. And I'm going to spend every waking second of my existence to do something good and, and make us better and be better and, and, and be a better man and, and, and give us a better country and challenge our, uh, uh, my colleagues to do it better. And we owe it to you, to everybody. And, and that's why I'm in it. And I, yeah, I, I, I love it. Well, you know, you got a little glimpse of the, the heat of, the na of a national when the national parties start paying attention to a race and what happens and the money and the, you know, the personal attacks and all this kind of stuff that happens on both sides. Um, are you prepared for what could be, you know, one of the biggest races in the country in 2012 when you run for re-election? Are you well, regretting that, that? that? Listen, uh, as I said, I'm focusing on doing my job. And if I do my job, then the rest will take care of itself. But make, make no mistake, I mean, I, 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 if you've read my book, you, you understand that I am ready. I'm always ready. I don't take anything for granted. And, uh, yeah, the, the dirty tricks have already started. You read about it yesterday with me and my family. And it's, uh, it's really uh, too bad that we're not focusing on the issues. You want to kind of do the whole gutcha game. And uh, they did it last time. And you say that the parties, no. I, I didn't run a negative race last year. I didn't do one negative commercial. And I don't plan on doing it again. Uh, yeah, well, the parties on both yeah, sides. well, I've told the parties to stay out of the race and let me go against the man or woman who's running against me and let us talk about the issues. You all deserve it. I mean, are you tired right now of all the kind of BS that we go through? Don't you want to know how we're going to solve the problems? All right, well, I want to wrap this up and I want to end it on a, on a question that came in that, um, you know, I thought I think it's, it's it's a good question. How did your past, it takes us back to the book, affect your take on love and marriage? Today you have two great kids, a wife, you seem so happy. Did you think you would do well Just in seen this? Just this morning. <laughs> <laughs> oh, tell us about that. I wanted to go to the gym. She didn't want to go right then, and I'm Mr. Impatient, so, you know. Did you think you would do well in this kind of environment? And what advice would you give to someone else who would experience the same kind of abuse? And that's, you know, I think uh, some people have said, Gee, are there lessons to be learned? You don't seem to be pushing any lessons on anyone on this book, but do you think there are, are you passing advice on? I, I think the, le the lessons are that regardless of our circumstances, um, if we have a few good people around us, you know, you can kind of break out of that cycle and, and, and have a better experience in life. Uh, and I was fortunate. And not unlike many other people, um, if you give of your time and your money and your, your effort to make a difference, you never know who you're going to reach and, and touch and, and make that difference. It could be mentoring somebody in academics. It could be coaching them in sports or musically or in theater or, or whatever it is. For me, I mean, if I wasn't busy, I needed to be busy. I mean, if I'm not busy, even now, I, I, I'm almost stir crazy. But right now, um, if you know people like me, you know, try to reach out and, and, and make a difference with, with them. And I think this part of me, like I said, a lot of these things in here, it's, it's, I'm glad I said it. I feel really good and balanced now. But um, it's only a small part of me because every day I'm doing something new and different. I mean, I've done stuff. I mean, can you imagine Scott Brown from Rentham, right? The truck is right outside. <laughs> All right, it's got 218,000 miles, and about an hour ago, I was upstairs looking at, you know, the life of, of the late President Kennedy and his family, and I'm here right now with you, with you, with all of you and all the people listening, and, I mean, give me a break. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it's overwhelming, but it's also extremely um, uh, uplifting and, and gratifying as well. 
All right, Senator Brown, thanks so much for sitting through all of these questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks.